Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for lesson two, a deep dive into IoT, which is part of our Hello IoT series, which will be running this week and next week. Before we start, I have a few quick things to go over. Please take a few minutes and read our code of conduct. We ask that everyone please be respectful. If you haven't already, please use the check-in link to check into this event. It is aka.ms slash reactor check-in and the event ID is 13422. By checking in, you will receive links, you will receive links to today's content that go along with the session. Please ask questions using the live chat. You should see two text boxes with a question mark over the top one. That is the live event Q&A. In the chat, I'll also be sharing some links to the Reactor Meetup page and monthly newsletter if you are interested in checking out what other sessions we have coming up. Today's session will be added to our Reactor YouTube page in 24 to 48 hours. You can find that recording also on this series page, which I will share in the chat. And then finally, I'll share a link to our Reactor survey. If you have a few minutes, we greatly appreciate your feedback. I will now pass it on to Jim. Cool, thank you very much. Hello everyone, welcome to this session. Let me just click the buttons to share my screen. Yay, and we're shared. Brilliant, so thank you everyone for coming to join me. This is lesson two of our IoT for Beginners series. A couple of days ago we did lesson one. Yesterday we had kind of a very relaxed office hours, some good conversation around the internet of things. Today we're looking at lesson two, a deeper dive into IoT, and then tomorrow we'll have another office hours. It just kind of ask me anything, very relaxed, casual session where we can talk about anything that we've covered in the lesson so far. Now, if you're this is the first time coming to one of these sessions. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Bennett. I'm an education cloud advocate at Microsoft. Uh, what that means, it's a job title that no one outside of Microsoft knows what it means, uh, but it means it's my job to help anybody who's learning be successful with Microsoft products, uh, especially students, teachers, but really anybody who's wanting to learn. Now, I particularly specialize in the Internet of Things and the cloud. So if you have any questions around IoT, the Internet of Things, you want to learn more about um, getting started with Microsoft products to do this or more about the stuff we're going to talk about today or in the rest of the series, I'm all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett. So you can reach out to me, Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever's your preferred way, get in touch and I'm here to help you out. Now I will start with this link, aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners. The link should appear in the chat in a few seconds. This is a link to a new 24 lesson IoT curriculum that we've put together to help you get started with the Internet of Things starting really at the basics. And this is kind of what we're covering over this eight lesson series. Today we're going to look at lesson two of this and show you what it is. It is all on GitHub. It's free. It's open source. You can fork it, clone it, do what you like with it. Use this content to learn yourself. Use it to teach in the classroom. Change it how you need for your particular requirements. So 24 lessons is all project based where you get your hands on with real world scenarios using just standard developer kits that you can use to kind of learn some of the basic principles of the Internet of Things. And so it's all project based. We've got constant check ins, assignments, lesson plans, everything you would need to learn this or teach this. Now, IoT, the T part is things. So I do want to give a shout out to our friends at Seed Studios. It's sometimes it's, it's hard with IoT projects, making sure you've got all the right hardware that you need. And it's so so often you end up you having to go to this place for one piece and this place for another place for another piece. And our friends of Seed have made it a little bit easier. AK.ms slash IoT dash beginners kit. This is a place you can go to and you'll be able to easily purchase the hardware you need to do this particular project. So it comes in one, one pack with all the hardware that you need to do everything in the curriculum. And we actually have two hardware choices, uh, Arduino or Raspberry Pi, and you can choose from one of two different packs. So big thanks to Seed for making it easier to buy this hardware. And you can literally go there and say, I want one pack, 100 packs, kind of whatever you need. OK, so let's dive in. So today's session is all about a deep dive. So in Monday's session, we kind of introduced IoT, talked a little bit about some of the dev kit choices that you can use as a developer and dived into some of the kind of scenarios around IoT. Today, we're going to go a bit deeper. We're going to look at the components of an IoT application, kind of how you would put together an end to end IoT solution. Uh, we're also going to do a 
deeper dive into microcontrollers, talk a bit more about the hardware and kind of how this all works. And then we're going to do another deeper dive into kind of single board computers, sort of the Raspberry Pis of this world, just to kind of get a better understanding of the hardware um, that is being used. And so there's this weird thing where my cursor disappears when I use PowerPoint. So if I can't actually scroll down to see any questions coming through. Cool. So if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I will do my best to keep checking every now and again uh, and answer those questions for you. So let's let's dig in. Let's start by talking about the components of an IoT application. So IoT is the Internet of Things and, that, and uh, IoT applications are made up of two pieces, the Internet and the thing. So on the thing side, you have some kind of hardware that interacts with the physical world. So this will gather data via sensors. It'll control the world via actuators. It'll be connected to things like light switches, thermostats, smart speakers, garage door openers, um, industrial machinery, you, know, you name it. The thing is attached to something and has that physical world interaction. It then shares data with services over the internet. And these services then implement the rest of the logic of your application. And this could be things just like administrative applications to see the data, reports, visualizations, data storage, AI models, data processing, kind of anything you need to understand the physical data you've captured from your, from your IoT device and then make decisions to then control your IoT device. So the thing, it's, so it's a device that can interact with the physical world. It's usually low power, low cost, low speed computer. Yeah, you don't, you wouldn't get take an absolute beast of a desktop machine and use that to monitor vibration in a piece of manufacturing equipment or monitor the temperature in your house. They're normally very small, uh, very low powered machines that just do one job: gather data, control some kind of system. So microcontrollers, for example, the RAM you get in those is kilobytes. The speed is megahertz. It's not the 3.7 megahertz, 16 core machine with 64 gigabytes of RAM. It's, you know, it's the 128 megahertz machine with 64 kilobytes of RAM. So, the, you know, potentially it can be quite low powered. Some a bit more powerful depending on uh, which type you go for. They're designed to run for a long period of time and gather, gather data or take actions. <laughs> So the kind of example, this is kind of my favorite example because this is one that a lot of us can relate to, is a thermostat, a standard smart thermostat. Now, many, many years ago, the original thermostats that I used to have, you'd have a, a control dial on the wall, you set that the temperature you want, and that would use a little thermocouple inside to measure the temperature. And if the temperature went below a certain point, the heating would come on. And then when the temperature go, went above a certain point, the heating would go off and that was your very basic heating control system. Now the smart versions of this bring in the power of the Internet of Things, bring in the power of the Internet. And so rather than just having a temperature control system, some kind of sensor and you know, heater control, you can bring in a whole load of Internet applications to handle that data and do a lot more with it. So as a kind of little bit of a bit of homework for you, um, if I've talked, we mentioned kind of a the thermostat gathers data, makes decisions with it. Well, have a think about the systems you have around you. We can talk about this in the office hours tomorrow, but what other systems are around you that read sensor data and use it to make decisions? You know, one example, I've got a garage door, automatic opener, but it's got sensors that read if there's something blocking the door. So the door will, I press a button, the door closes. If it reads something in the way, it stops. So think about what you've got around you that's like this, that reading sensor data and using it to make decisions. So the thing, as I said, gathers data, you know, does stuff with it. One idea would be a thermostat gathers temperature data. Now, the Internet side of this is all about applications that manage the data. So your thing sends data to the Internet and the Internet side of things will do things like process the data, send and receive messages from devices, make decisions uh, and then use those decisions to request messages go to a device to do things. So the, the internet side of it is all about the smarts behind it. Now, a typical kind of setup would be some kind of cloud service that everything sends data to. So all your devices connect to one cloud service, some one kind of big pipe, and that cloud service would manage things like security. You're making sure that only your devices are sending data. We don't want, we don't want to get hacked here. There was a famous story of a casino that got hacked via a temperature sensor in a fish tank. 
you know, somebody else could get into that, get connect to the, the, the sensor and then from there onto the network. And obviously you don't want that, you want security. So you wanna make sure your whole cloud setup is secure. The cloud service will also interact with sensors and then connect to apps. It's kind of sensors come in one side of the pipe, connect to apps on the other side, apps then connect on, one, on the other side of the pipe, data goes back to the sensors. So it's kind of like this big pipe of connections, IT devices on one end, applications on the other. And then you can connect loads of other things to your cloud setup, things like your phone. You're using your phone, you can see the temperature in your house, for example, if you had a smart thermostat. Now it's not always just the internet. Sometimes the, in the internet of things are devices that are connected to each other via things like mesh networks. And this can either be just so devices can communicate with each other, or so devices can then communicate with the cloud. So one example will be the, the Zigbee service, where you built Zigbee devices can talk to each other, but there'll be one central Zigbee hub that connects to the cloud. So if you get a new Zigbee device, it just detects your Zigbee network, sends a message, and the messages just jump from device, 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 till it hits the hub and goes to the cloud. Sometimes they don't even go to the cloud. Sometimes you have internet things networks where they just self-contain, they just talk to each other and just gather data and, and make decisions themselves. But in general, a lot of what you see of the internet things is connected to the cloud. <laughs> So think about a smarter thermostat. Yeah, how we build a smarter thermostat. There's something that's more like I mean, what I've got in my house at the moment. So for that, first of all, we need more data. Yeah, my, my very first thermostat I had when I was in my very first house or when I was growing up was one temperature sensor on the wall outside the kitchen and that measured the temperature for the whole house. And obviously that wasn't very smart because especially when you got a lot of heat coming out of the kitchen from the oven, the whole way outside the kitchen was warm, the rest of the house was cold. So you end up with multiple sensors. You know, a good smart thermostat system won't just measure the temperature in one place, it'll measure it in multiple places. In my house right now, for example, I have a sensor in my living room, I have a sensor in my upstairs hallway, I have a sensor in my downstairs hallway, and a sensor in my bedroom. And that can then use that data to make decisions. I have a control input, and this is a dial on the wall, so I can set what temperature I want. I have my HVAC systems, as they seem to call it in America. I'm not sure what the V stands for, but it's my heating and air conditioning system. And my thermostat can control that. But rather than just make all the decisions on the device, it will send the data to the cloud and then use the cloud to help make decisions as to what needs to be done with my heating and cooling system. So one thing is just things like the app. I've got, I've got a mobile app and in my mobile app, I can control it. I can say I want a temperature of you know, 20 degrees Celsius, for example. My mobile app doesn't talk to my thermostat. My mobile app talks to the cloud, the cloud talks to the thermostat. So I can use my app via the cloud to make decisions. You can also look at things like weather data. So it can see that there's a hot day coming tomorrow. You know, we maybe don't need, don't need the heating tonight. You know, it can kind of make smart decisions. It's got a, a, an economy setting that will actually look at weather data. It'll look at uh, how much heating and cooling has been done across other people's houses based off the weather data and use that to make smart decisions to heat and cool my house efficiently, saving me money. And I could even hook it up to my calendar so that it knows when I'm on vacation. And when I'm on vacation, it won't bother worrying about heating or cooling my house unless it needs to to deal with extreme temperatures. And so what's started off as just a thermocouple on, on the wall connected to a heating system with the power of the cloud now becomes a system that can manage the heat, the temperature in my house efficiently, smartly, take into account where I am in the world, whether I'm home or not, and allow me to control everything via my app. And you know, it means I could fly off for a work trip and then when I'm coming home, I could turn my heating on from the on-plane Wi-Fi so I know when I get home I'm nice and warm. It's kind of a whole load more you can do with it. And this is just one simple kind of consumer um, example of an Internet of Things application, kind of bringing together the device and the cloud. So another bit of homework for you, something to think about. Yeah, we can have some discussion in the chat if you want to, or we can discuss this in office hours tomorrow. What other data could make a thermostat even smarter? What else could we gather that could help our thermostat be even smarter? Have a think about this. IoT fundamentally is about data. It's using data from sensors with data from other systems to make decisions to interact back with the physical world. So what other data could be combined with our temperature data to make our thermostat even smarter? Bit of, bit of homework for you. Okay, now when we talk about the Internet of Things, it's not always, as I said, it wasn't always just about the Internet. Sometimes it's about meshes of devices coming together and talking to each other. And sometimes there are situations where you want 
Internet of Things, but without the actual Internet side of things. Uh, so one question popped up. Can you please can tell me if a sensor can receive data from Internet and pass the data to actuator or do an action on actuator receives data from Internet sensors is only used to gather send data to the Internet? Um, so you can completely have completely separate sensors and actuators. Uh, so you kind of build the application in a way that works for you. So you would have a sensor and that could send data to the Internet or that could even have local app. Uh, and, um, analytics and send data straight to, the act, to an actuator. But you can have one IoT device with the sensor, another IoT device with an actuator on it, and they can all be controlled via the internet. They don't need to be connected. Um, one example might be in an industrial setting, you could have multiple temperature and vibration sensors on a very expensive piece of machinery, all independently gathering data, all independently sending that to some form of analytics in the cloud. And then if a decision is made that there's maintenance needed maybe that could, could trigger a completely separate actuator that turns off the power to the machine or routes things to, to an alternative machine while that one's being repaired so um, and you can do logic on devices you don't have to connect it to the cloud you can just have a smart device in itself um you know you can just have the thermostat that will measure the temperature control and heating without connecting to the internet it's just you only need to connect the internet if you need to do so to kind of bring in more logic um and kind of one area that kind of leads very nicely onto what I want to talk about next, which is about doing IoT without internet connection. So you, even though it's called Internet of Things, you don't necessarily need to have an internet connection. And one example of why you might need this would be um, areas of low connectivity. Cruise ships, container ships, um, farming out in uh, third world countries, to, to, um, developing nations where you may not have good connectivity. It could be places where you don't want to have internet connectivity because of security. Um, so what you can do, you can kind of add the internet to these particular things by using things like edge computing. And the idea is you would have a device that has your, your all your logic and that runs on the same network as your IoT devices. And your IoT devices, they gather data, they interact with the physical world, they send the data to your edge device and that sits on the same local network. And then your edge device can make decisions or your edge device can connect to the cloud net like a gateway. So one example might be you want to do predictive maintenance on a piece of machinery. You want to get you want to measure um, vibration, temperature and make decisions about whether the machine is going to fail or not. So what you can do, is you can gather all the data from uh, a whole of sensors on the machine. And rather than send data from, you know, 100,000 sensors over the Internet, you can send it to an AI model that you train in the cloud, download to an edge device and run on the edge device. And that vibration and temperature data never leaves your network. It's just controlled by the edge device. And then the only time that would leave your network is if you wanted to. You wanted to gather analytics such as how often is the machine going to fail or send a notification that I've predicted a failure. And then you take advantage of the cloud to retrain the models that run on the edge device. Can you elaborate between gateway and edge device? Is it possible to have both in a setup or a single device that can serve the purpose of both? So an edge device is any device that's running on your local network that is acting a bit like the cloud. That's really kind of what it is. So a gateway is an edge device. It's a type of edge device. Um, so yes, you can have both because a device can be an edge device that's acting as a gateway. So gateways are all about um, changing the way your, your IoT devices send data to the cloud. So a classic example of a gateway device would be if you have a set of really old sensors that cannot send data in a format that your cloud provider can use, you can then use them. You can actually point them at a gateway device and these devices send data to a gateway device. Your gateway device can convert that data into a format that your IT service can use and send the data on. Your device, you may have IT devices that are completely insecure and you don't want to connect those over the Internet. So you can connect those to a gateway device that's in your network and that gateway device then will send data um, you know, in a secure fashion over the internet to your IoT service. So a gateway device is just a type of edge device. An edge device is anything where you've got the logic running in your local network, usually connected to the internet, usually running models that you train in the cloud or running services that you manage in the cloud. So it's cloud managed devices, not like an on-premise network as such, it's cloud managed devices. Um, but yes, a gateway device is just a type of edge device. 
So another kind of classic example for an edge device would be running some kind of image classification model for things like hard hat compliance in, a, um, in an industrial site. You could train a model to recognize heads with hard hats and heads without hard hats, and you don't want to live stream security footage over the internet because that eats up a lot of bandwidth. So instead, you train the model in the cloud, download it to an edge device, run your live streams from your security cameras to your edge device and do the analytics on the edge device. And that way, when you add 100 more cameras, you just add a few more edge devices and you can kind of scale up that way. OK, so let's talk about security. Let's talk a little bit about security. I mean, I've touched on this a little bit, but I do think it's worth just taking a moment to stop and think of security. There is an old joke that the S in IoT stands for security. And of course, there is no S in IoT because some of the original IoT devices did not have security. Now, in reality, these are devices that connect to the cloud, which means they are as secure as the devices and as secure as the cloud. Which means <clears throat> they can be hacked. And there's multiple different ways that IoT devices can be hacked. Okay. And it's kind of very important that we take a moment to kind of think about these because it's very, very important. OK, so the first way it can be hacked is somebody can hack your IoT device itself. So somebody can get some malicious code onto your IoT device or they can access your IoT device somehow and hack that. Yeah, I mentioned that uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago about a casino that got hacked via a smart thermostat. Now, a lot of IoT devices have a Wi-Fi hotspot on them so you can connect to them and configure them. Yeah, they don't know what your Wi-Fi network is, so they broadcast a hotspot. You connect to that hotspot. You then set, set up configuration data. The IoT device then connects to your Wi-Fi. Sometimes they don't bother to close the hotspot, so anybody can connect to your device. And because these are hotspots designed for consumers to use the first time to connect, they have no password or a predefined password that everybody knows because you have to know it to configure the device. So if you've got a smart thermostat that's still broadcasting a Wi-Fi network, that's an access point that hack you can use to attack, attack, get onto your IoT device, and then potentially hack the firm on the IoT device and route requests up the cloud. So if your device is not secure, you have problems. When your device connects to the cloud, there are multiple ways it can connect. So in uh, next week, we'll actually look at sending messages via MQTT to cloud services without any form of security. So you can, in theory, have a cloud service that you can send messages to with no security. So this is a very, very bad thing, but you can do it and some people do do it. And it's not just the security of the, the connectivity, it's also the security of your data. Because if you're storing data captured from an IoT device, that needs to be secure. Otherwise, a hacker can see your data. I mean, some kind of examples of where this has been used. There was the, um, the Stuxnet worm um, which manipulated valves in centrifuges. So somebody actually hacked centrifuges to report a lower speed than they were spinning. So they spun really fast and actually broke the machinery. And this was in uh, uranium enrichment plants. And it actually broke the machinery. It's rumored to be a nation state hack uh, by a couple of large, large international nations. Um, so that actually damaged hardware via a hack. Uh, baby monitors. There's a lot of baked cloud connected baby monitors with incredibly poor security where hackers have hacked in watched what your kids are doing when they're sleeping and even talked to the kids. You know, voice control baby monitors started scaring young kids that have been monitored by baby monitors. You know, some pretty horrendous attacks that have happened because of things not secure. There's been data gathered from kids' toys stored in unsecured buckets in the cloud where people have actually been able to download the data the you know, messages kids have sent to their parents or parents have sent to kids. There's been hacks on security cameras watching people uh, in their private homes. It's yeah, there's been a lot of lot of hacks. So the very, very first thing you should do when considering building an IoT device is think about security. Get it secure first, feature second. Very, very important. And luckily, a lot of cloud services help you with this. So the Microsoft uh, One IoT Hub, for example, that only secure devices can connect. So when you connect, you have to be you have to put a key so only certain devices can connect there's a version of microsoft defender for it that can actually spot firmware hacks and you know there's a lot of tools coming out to help with security but you must 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 consider security it's very important i cannot bang on about this enough it's uh, such an easy area to hack so got to be secure one secure way doing it is air gapping the idea that you're completely isolated from the uh, the internet 
Okay. Yeah, if you've got, say, like, a, if you're running a, um electricity generation, you know, you're, you're running a power station, the computers that control your machinery probably shouldn't be connected to the internet. There was a recent case in the US where an oil pipeline was hacked because the control systems for it were connected to the internet and got hacked. This is a very bad thing. So one way to think about security is actually air gapping. Literally, there is no connection. Um, many, many years ago, I did an internship for a company that needed security and they had an internal network that just wasn't connected to the internet. There was literally no physical way you could get the data off premises because there was no internet connection, which is kind of a great idea for security. Now, air gapping can be just literally there is no connection or you can take advantage of gateways. So the data goes to a gateway and that gateway can then act like an air gap and it can just make a secure connection, maybe on a separate network card. And there's ways you can keep an air gap network there while still being able to take data off it. But air gapping is a good way to make sure that things are physically isolated and therefore secure. So if you're doing things like smart cities, smart grids, smart energy, anything of like a large scale where there's high risk of, of hacks, you know, that where a hack could take down an entire city, entire country, possibly. Think about air gapping. It's kind of a nice way to keep things secure. And also some more homework for you, something to think about. But again, we can talk about this in office hours tomorrow is what other security challenges or scenarios can you think of for IT systems around you? So what are some of the other security things you want to you need to think about? Just think about think about that for a bit. Um, and then maybe do some research, maybe Google IT security and then get scared and probably never want to use IT devices ever again. <laughs> okay, so let's actually dive deeper into things. Let's actually do a deeper dive into the hardware. Let's start by talking about microcontrollers. So a microcontroller, as we talked about on, on Monday, is a small, low-powered, low-speed, low-spec device that runs one thing. So you write one bit of firmware, and that's what runs on your device. You probably don't have an operating system on there, or if you do, it's what's called a real-time operating system that's very thin, very lightweight, and just provides services to your application. And so they're very low power, very, very low powered. Now, in a microcontroller, the way it works, you have kind of a CPU, a central processing unit, and that's your brain. And that's the bit that actually manages all the data going around inside, the, um, the, inside your, your IoT device. Now, CPUs have a tick. They, they have a clock that ticks on a regular cycle, and each tick synchronizes the actions that the CPU can take. So, for example, a tick can pull data from somewhere, send data to here, do something with it, and it's every tick it'll do something. And the tick keeps all the components of the system together. You know, if it, if it makes a request to something, it'll get the request back on the next tick, and it kind of manages those ticks to keep the actions going. And these ticks are measured in what's called Hertz, which is ticks per second. And most processors are run in megahertz or gigahertz. So megahertz is a million hertz, gigahertz is a billion hertz. Most microcontrollers are in the megahertz range. Desktop computers, laptop computers are in the in the gigahertz range. You know, my mine's like a three gigahertz computer, what have you. But microcontrollers are usually in the megahertz range. Now the way these uh, CPUs work is they have a, a cycle called uh, fetch, decode, execute. And so every clock tick, the CPU will fetch an instruction from memory, execute that instruction. So we fetch it, decode it, and execute it. And that's kind of done every, every tick. Some, some executions take multiple ticks, depending on what they are. So for example, the, the instruction might be add two numbers. So it'll get the instruction using an ALU, an a arithmetic logic unit. I always get the tongue twist now. An arithmetic logic unit, an ALU, to add two numbers together. And so it's fetch, decode, execute. Every tick, it'll kind of do that cycle. And then some things take multiple cycles to do. And then if there's things that actions like it's waiting on a network call, what it can do is the instruction might be sent something to network, and then it can do other instructions while it waits for response to come back. It uses the system called interrupt. So send to network, wait to get a message back to say it's finished, and it can do other stuff at the same time. And yeah, so microcontrollers, very low speed. Uh, one particular one, I will show you a device. Where's my camera here? So this one here, this is a Weir terminal. It's a Arduino-based microcontroller from Seed Studios. It's tucked away inside there in this lovely little box with buttons and what have you on the screen on there. This runs at 120 megahertz. So this is not particularly fast. Uh, I had a PC that ran at 120 megahertz back in 1996. 
96, I want to say, 96, 97. So, you know, these are running at the speeds of desktop computers of 25 years ago. But you can run one of these for like three years on a battery. So, you know, you kind of win with that. And a lot of these CPUs as well, they contain one or two cores. Um, you know, one or two CPUs, no more than that. A lot of desktop computers have four, eight more. I mean, I've got my, I've, I'm running a, a MacBook Air here that's got eight cores in it and eight cores of graphics processing and 16 cores of AI processing and all running at three gigahertz, which is substantially faster than a single core running at 120 uh, megahertz. So one big thing about this, every time the clock ticks, it draws power and generates heat. So every tick, you get a little bit of heat and that heat's got to go somewhere. So microcontrollers, they want at low speeds, uh, so they don't generate much heat. And some of them even have two types of cores. They'll have a high performance core and a low, low power core. And when it's not doing anything, it can switch to low power core to reduce the heat generation. So microcontrollers don't normally worry too much about heat. On desktop computers, where they, they tick faster, they, they use more power and therefore they generate a lot of heat. So you have to think about things like cooling, which is why you have a fan probably inside your computer. And if you're doing a lot of work, you'll hear the fan spin up because it has to cool the computer down. And the really fast computers have uh, water cooling, liquid nitrogen cooling, all these different ways of cooling. Microcontrollers don't need that. They don't draw enough power. They're designed to run potentially batteries, so they don't draw enough power. Um, but something to investigate. So investigate some of them about the heat and power usage of microcontroller devices. Something to investigate, and again, we can talk about this in the office hours tomorrow. So memory. So CPU is the thing that actually pro does the processing, actually does the logic. What about memory? So what is, where do you store your program? So in your microcontroller, you have usually kind of two types of memory. You have something that stores your program code, and that's persisted when there's no power. So you flash, it, you flash your program code to it, you write that to some kind of flash memory, and your program sits on there, and then when you plug in your, your microcontroller, it runs your program. And then you have what's called RAM, which is the application memory where the variables are stored, and that gets reset really when there's no power. Pull the power out, it goes. Plug it back in, your program starts up again from scratch. And so the memory on the microcontroller is substantially smaller than what you'd get on your desktop PC. So we at the Wii terminal, again, 192 kilobytes of RAM. You know, that's not very much at all. You uh, standard PC, you know, I've got one with eight gigs of RAM and I struggle with this one. I've got a 16 gig on its way. Um, so, you know, it's 16, 16 um, gigs of RAM compared to 192 kilobytes. It's, you know, if you draw a big square for eight gigs, for example, 192 kilobytes, is a tiny dot in the middle. It's very, very small. Same with the program storage. So we are terminal's got four megs of flash storage. I've got 500 gigabytes in my computer here. So it's a lot smaller. Now, if you've not come across, if not, if you've never really understood what a byte means, a byte is a value from zero to 255. And that can store one letter, for example. And uh, so, you know, 500 gigabytes, 500 trillion letters. It's a lot, it's an absolute lot. Whereas a uh, microcontroller, that's substantially smaller. So again, something to think about, check out the specs of your computer, compare that to a microcontroller. What I will do is I will actually just show you some of the parts of a microcontroller. Can't we really see it at the weird terminal? Unfortunately, the, the lovely case with the screen means you can't see much. Um, but here's a good one to look at. This here is a Raspberry Pi Pico. And that chip there contains all the things. So that's got two cores in there. So it's got two processors in there and it's got memory. It's like 128 kilobytes of memory or something. It's got a small amount of memory. It's all tucked there in that one small chip and that has kind of everything on it. You know, most of the board, the reason the board, this board is so big is to have these pins so you can connect stuff to it. But most of it's just tucked inside that one chip, a couple of processors and memory. You compare this kind of the, the CPU you'd get on a desktop computer and the CPU itself is potentially larger than this entire thing. Well, it's usually a lot larger than this. And so you can get CPUs bigger than this. So yeah, that's more. Now, microcontrollers need to talk to things. IoT devices, they interact with the physical world via sensors and actuators. And the reason, the way they act, they 
interact with the with the, the physical world is by having connections to devices. They have some form of I/O input output, something that connects two things, some um, to either gather data or send out to actuators. And most of them have what's called GPIO, general purpose input output. And these are standard pins that you can send data to, send, well, send a voltage to really, or get a voltage back from. And that voltage is then converted into, um, into data. So again, just looking back at some different devices, the Weo terminal, you'll see it's got a lot of holes here. This you can stick cables in, and there's a number of pins you can interact with. Uh, for example, here you can solder pins onto these and use those to interact with it. Here's another one here, it's ESP32. It's got pins on there and you can push this into a, a breadboard, which is one of these boards with holes in it, and you can connect wires to it to interact with them. And this is how you connect sensors and actuators. You would connect things to this to receive a voltage. So sensors work by sending a voltage actual ways to work by you send a voltage to them to do stuff and so they have these all these input output pins now my controls as i said are small very very small smallest one is the freescale uh kinetis which is small enough to fit in the dimple of a golf ball it's 1.6 millimeter by two millimeter by one millimeter it is tiny absolutely minuscule very very small boards Things like the weird terminal, for example, that's 72 millimeters by 57 millimeters by 12 millimeters. And that's for the whole thing um, in its box, in its case with its screen. Whereas the average CPU of like a PC, for example, is substantially larger and that's just the processor. So these are really small devices and you, know, you can connect them to very, very tiny devices. You wanna build a bit of hardware, you wanna make it small, the microcontrollers are small enough that you can do that. Now, so what do microcontrollers actually run? So they don't run an open operating system. You can't plug a microcontroller into a monitor, keyboard and mouse and actually have a whole interactive operating system. You can't load up a photo, browser, photo editing application on a web browser. They don't work like that. They perform one focused task and does it well. They don't run the traditional kind of operating system. They, they can run an operating system, so you can program them using a, a, what's called a real-time operating system that provides things like multi-threading and a bit of network connectivity, or you can program them using a thing called a framework. So a framework is just a part-built stack that you write your code that fits into, and the framework provides you some lot, some um, some sample, uh, some libraries to allow you to do bits and pieces. It's kind of Arduino is one of the classic frameworks. Uh, you may have heard this before. So with Arduino, you've got setup method and a loop method just you write code in your set in a method called setup and that gets run when your application starts up you write code in a method called loop and that gets run continuously in a loop and you kind of fill out the rest of it for you there's no kind of operating system behind it um, and there's usually libraries that come with your framework or your real-time operating system that can talk to sensors and actuators either that comes with from the manufacturer of the framework or that there's external ones so you don't do much you just literally write the um do you write the kind of the bare bones code and the framework provides you with the basics around it but it's nothing like what you would get on your programming desktop for example you don't get all the libraries for interacting with bluetooth and sound and video and machine learning and all that you kind of get a little bit to talk over the pins and then you have to get some, some specific libraries to talk to whatever hardware um is there so you can get real-time operating systems do for things like multi-threading, networking. Um, you, a lot of these have got uh, components that talk to IoT services. Occasionally you do get some UI components if you do need to build a screen-based thing, but they're very, very lightweight. Yeah, you can't run an OS. You know, Windows, for example, takes multiple gigabytes. You can't run that on a device that's only got 128 kilobytes of RAM in it, of, um, of storage. You know, you can't do that. So they're really lightweight operating systems if they do run. And there's things like Azure RTOS, Free RTOS, Ceph RTOS that you can use that provide basic capabilities, usually just designed to, to handle messages going back and forth and, and multiple threads to run multiple blocks of code in parallel. So a bit of homework for you. Check out Azure Artos. That's a good one to look at. Um, it has a number of different components around things like multi-threading, um, analyzing events in real time, network architectures, file systems for accessing um, SD cards or other file things, GUI runtimes, and USB connectivity as well. So a bit of homework, investigate that. Other ones you look at, FreeRTOS and Zephyr. 
um, run across a whole lot of different devices. So just a bit of homework to do is check out some of these real-time operating systems. So Arduino, Arduino is probably the most popular microcontroller framework around, named after a bar in Italy where they came up with the idea for it. And you can buy hardware either from Arduino or from other manufacturers that's Arduino compatible, and then you use the Arduino framework to, to program them. So Arduino is all open source. Um, I say it was all open source. They've just announced some pro boards that are not open source, uh, but, but the bulk of it is open source uh, hardware and software that you can use uh, to program up. Now you program in C or C++, microcontrollers, low power, you need a um, a programming language that can run in that you can heavily optimize in terms of size and heavily optimize in terms of performance, which C and C++ does. Yeah, you can't do garbage collection on um, microcontrollers easily. It's just, that's not powerful enough. So you want something compiled nice and small and say Arduino, you code it using the Arduino framework, uh, which is a really nice way to get started. Um, you're pretty much based around as I said, a setup method and a loop method, and then a load of open source libraries that come from manufacturers for interacting with all the various different hardware. And Arduino, there's you know, lots of different devices that support Arduino. And that's for the IT for beginners, we use Arduino as one of the hardware options. So Arduino, so the way it works, you have setup, you have loop, your broad powers up, runs your setup function once, you, you just create a piece of code and you have a function called setup and the all the, the internals of the Arduino compiler works out what it needs to do and calls your setup code. And then there you would set up things like your Wi-Fi, um, any sensors, any actuators, things like that. And then it calls loop and it just runs that again and again and again and again. And you have to build your logic inside the loop to, to handle that. Uh, sorry, quest. Uh, ah, losing control of my computer. Um, so I just let me just dive into a couple of questions that are here. Uh, will the office hours session also be posted to YouTube? Yes, yesterday's office hours, tomorrow's office hours will be on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, is the framework the same as SDK? Uh, no. So framework is kind of is probably closer to an operating system. The framework is what makes it run, what makes it work. Um, it does have some SDKs built in to interact with uh, the various components of it. Uh, so if you use the Arduino framework on a Wii terminal, for example, It'll give you the setup method, the loop method. You write your code and it runs inside there. Um, and as part of the Arduino libraries, they have some SDKs for interacting with certain hardware components, sending signals to pins, reading signals from pins. And then with the Wii terminal, if you want to do more things like work with the SD card, you can then install the relevant SDK. So Arduino has a concept of libraries where it's third party code where you can add to your projects. You can add the seed SD card library or the seed flashcard um, memory library to access storage on here. Or you bring in a seed Grove library to interact with um, a, a particular piece of hardware that you can plug into the Grove sockets on the bottom of this and interact with that. So it's kind of different SDKs that you can then add to the framework. So it's kind of not the same. The framework's kind of closer to, yeah, it's it's kind of the runtime that makes things work. It, do, it does have some SDKs that allow you to interact with various components. Are there many IoT devices in an airplane? Oh, like you like you couldn't possibly imagine how many there are on an airplane. Airplanes are rammed with IoT devices. Really good question. Yes, there are so many IoT devices on airplanes. Um, engine manufacturers, so companies like Rolls-Royce, when they build an engine, they will put thousands of devices in the engine to measure all the different uh, things that are happening with it. And that way pilots can get alerts if there's a potential engine problem. Maintenance crews can literally plug something in and download the data. They're not internet connected. You know, when you're at 30,000 feet, the airplane, the engine is not sending data to the cloud. It's more using, um, there's more stores it locally. And then when you land, they can download that data. Um, sometimes it is, it can be sent to edge devices running on the plane. So you may have a box on the plane that's doing live analytics. But yes, planes are covered in IoT devices. You know, you, you want to make sure the plane is not going to fail. Um, so they will just pack them for thousands, thousands of IoT devices. Um, maybe office hours tomorrow, we can actually have a, have a quick search and find, see if we can find out how many are on the different planes, but thousands of them, absolutely thousands of them. Really good question. It's a fantastic use case for IoT devices because you need to know when things are working and when things are not working when you're at 30,000 feet. So great question. Okay. So we talked about setup and loop. 
Um, so your setup run, gets runs once on Arduino, connect to Wi-Fi, cloud services, and your loop does all the things. The loop runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. And it's similar to if you've done any kind of event loop programming. Uh, you know, if you a classic Windows programmer of many years ago where you had the uh, the event the message pump and things like that, it's like that. <clears throat> so you would write code in your loop to do event processing. You know, have some kind of state management of your application and track the different events coming in. Now, one thing you also need to think about in your loop is a delay. So if you're constantly doing work, 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 that is using power. IoT devices, they can run continuously, but a lot of the time you want to save power. So, for example, you don't necessarily need to measure the temperature in my house a thousand times a second. It's just there's just no point. You said you might want to measure it once every minute. And so you would write something and then you have a delay, some kind of sleep where your microcontroller goes to sleep for, for a minute, then wakes up and processes it again. So it's kind of logic you put in your loop to do the thing and then sleep as long as necessary. And that cuts down the amount of power. Yeah, if you want to have devices that can run for years on a battery, you don't want it to be measure, 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 measure. You want it to sleep and only measure as much as you need to. Obviously, if you need to measure 10,000 times a second, that's fine. You know, if you're putting IoT devices on an F1 car, you probably want 1,000 readings a second potentially. Um, so you can make, make decisions based off that. But if you don't, you think about sleeping, um, keeping that event loop sleeping so you save power. <coughs> Is it mandatory to consider WEO for all the IoT devices available? So I'm not sure what you mean by, by that question. The WEO terminal is just one of the many different available Arduino devices. There are loads around. Um, the reason I refer to the WEO is we use this in the IoT for Beginners course as the Arduino um, device. Reason for using it is it uses an ecosystem of sensors called Grove, and this device has sockets. Uh, I'll show you. It's got sockets on the bottom to plug um, hardware in. So you know, I don't want to teach people how to solder LEDs. Instead, you can just get an LED that you, that you plug straight into these sockets. So the reason I'm mentioning WEO is we use it in the IT for Beginners curriculum. It's a lovely beginner's device. It's got buttons and microphone and screen built in. It's got pins on the back built in. It's reasonably powerful. Um, and let's say it does this Grove ecosystem where you can just plug sensors straight in and not have to worry about putting resistors on LEDs and stuff like that. Um, so that's why I mention it. And in the IT for Beginners course, <clears throat> if you go down the Arduino route, then we use the WEO terminal for that. So that's why I mention it. Okay, so Arduino has whole standard libraries for interacting with pins. Um, it means that you can write Arduino code to pull data from a pin, uh, sleep for a while, and then compile that for a wide range of different devices. And the device manufacturer builds the Arduino framework specific for that device. Uh, so it means you can just take one piece of code and recompile it for multiple different devices and get the same kind of functionality without worrying about the yeah, specific device. It's a very good abstraction of the device specific implementations. It's very nice. Cool. So we talked about the wheel terminal a little bit. Let's move from Arduino to kind of single board computers a bit and let's talk about. Uh, oh, uh, there we go. This question popped up before we do. Are there best practices for choosing the number of microcontrollers in production? For example, set of 100 devices or 1,000 devices? Um, it's It depends. It's all down to what do you need? What You want to have enough to gather the data that you want without flooding yourself with data. You know, if you've got a machine and one vibration sensor is enough to tell you the machine is failing, then you need one vibration sensor. But if one is not enough if there's multiple parts of a machine you might measure in 10 different locations you might want 10 sensors with potentially 10 iot devices so there is kind of no best practice it's um as many as you need but ideally no more because every device is gathering data one thing we talked about on monday is that iot devices they estimate by 2025 will be producing 80 zettabytes of data a year 80 trillion gigabytes of data a year and sifting through that data is hard so if you put a thousand iot devices on your factory and you measure all this data and you don't have any use for that data, it's just a waste. It's hard to analyze all that to pull out the signals that you need. So ideally you want as few as possible, gathering as little data as possible to get the signals you need to make the decisions you need. <coughs> Excuse me. Too much data is, is hard, too little data, and you can't do anything with it. And so obviously it's, yeah, knowing what the right amount is, is 
is very, 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 very hard. Um, it's You have to understand your domain. You have to understand what you're doing. If you're a farmer, for example, <clears throat> and you want to do soil moisture measurement, you have to know your farm. You have to know the fields in your farm. You have to know the water flow. Yeah, you, if, if you know that water flows from this higher field down to a lower field, then you know, you know that the, you probably just need to measure the water level at the higher field because once you water that it will flow to the lower field so you don't have to worry too much about the lower because the higher one is, is an important one whereas uh you know if you've got two completely separate fields with no water interaction between the two you want to measure in both fields yeah you know, if your field's on a slope you might want to measure at the top and bottom so it's all about understanding um your domain understanding what your needs are and then try and gather the least amount of data that allows you to make that decision because extra data is you know it's hard to sift through uh, George says, what about security? Um, we did talk about security earlier on. Is the S and IoT stands for security. Yeah, it's hard. Um, can you just can you just be a bit more specific about what you mean by um, by security? And I'll and I um and I will answer. Because um, yeah, massive topic security. So cool. Let's talk. Take a moment to talk about single board computers. We talked about microcontrollers. Talk about single board computers. Uh, my favourite one's the Raspberry Pi comes from Raspberry Pi Foundation, a charity in the UK founded in 2009, designed to promote the study of computer science at school level. And they did this by building a computer that is low cost, plugs into your TV and allows kids to code. I will show you one. Here's one here. This is the new latest Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi 4. Absolutely fantastic computer. Um, and this weighs in this at 35 US dollars. So this is Accessibly priced for a computer, substantially cheaper than anything than really anything else of its power. Runs a version of Linux, and you can plug that into your TV, plug in a keyboard, monitor, mouse, and away you go. You've got a full Linux computer with a full desktop environment. Absolutely lovely machines. They come in different variations. Uh, one second. Where did I put them? Uh. Cleared off my desk earlier and can't find anything. Um, come in different variations, such as this one here, the Raspberry Pi 400. Uh, this is a Raspberry Pi built into a keyboard. Sockets on the back, GPIO pins, same on here, GPIO pins, similar to on the microcontroller, and USB sockets and HDMI sockets. And this is an all in one keyboard. You plug in a mouse, plug this into your TV, and you've got a computer. Uh, if, you've, if you grew up like me with ZX Spectrums and Commodore 64s, then this is basically that for the modern age running Linux. It's a fantastic device. Also do a Pi Zero, teeny tiny one here, $5 without Wi-Fi, $10 with. Uh, again, great little small computer, runs Linux, plugs into your TV if you want to, or into a monitor for Linux device. And on top of this, they do a compute module, which is kind of the core parts of this without all the USB ports and the Ethernet ports that you can then connect into your custom hardware. So it's a pretty good range of things that they do. Now, <clears throat> these are a full single board computer. So this runs a full operating system. This runs Linux. I'll show you it runs Linux. Uh, oh, it's gone. Let me just connect to it. Here you go. This is a full Raspberry Pi OS version of Debian Linux with all the kind of tools you want, web browsers and all that kind of stuff. And this is running on here yeah, running on that that little bo box there and that's running here full web browser full full linux computer 35 bucks absolutely fantastic devices and they have I mean, these are powerful so these aren't these are desktop power not microcontroller power we're talking quad core 1.5 gigahertz cpu two four eight gigs of ram wi-fi gigabit ethernet hdmi ports usb ports gpo pins sd cards blah blah blah, 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 blah. all of the things they've got a lot of stuff in them you pay more they put a lot of power you know these have to be plugged into USB C power supplies so they're not low power you can't run them off batteries um, but they're very powerful devices so on here Big silver square there, that's the processor. Got a heatsink on it because it runs fast. Black thing there, that's the memory chip. This one here is a four gig model. Then it's got a specialized camera connector to plug a Raspberry Pi camera. Two 60 frames per second HDMI ports, one full HD. Uh, you can run, I think, 4K out of both of these at the same time, which is nice. USB-C power, microphone socket, USB 2, USB 3, 
gigabit ethernet a full powerful computer and this is the ones where you want if you want to run really powerful workloads as an IT device they're great for that also they're great because they run a version of Linux so you can program them with any tools that you want uh, you know it's not like a microcontroller where you need to use a small lightweight framework code in C or C++ or possibly MicroPython this is it's Linux you know you want to run, run a bit of JavaScript you want to run some Java Go Rust you know dot net whatever they do all the things now you can when you run it it runs a version of linux you can run it either head uh, the full version which is the one i've got going here with uh, the ui or you can run it headless without ui which boots up much quicker and, and takes less power so Raspberry pi zero uh, this skin is a lot smaller it's a single core one gigahertz cpu half gig of ram one hdmi port but again 40 pins sd card slot and camera camera slot all based off arm processors so the arm is the thing that's in most mobile phones uh, some of the Microsoft Surface devices, all the new new uh, Apple M1 Macs, all based off ARM processors, and that's what runs inside the Pi Zeros. Very powerful machines. Um, you're really great as a as a developer to get started because you don't have to have plug, program it from a computer. A microcontroller you code up from your desktop laptop. Raspberry Pi you just boot up to that and and code on it. And you say full OS if it runs on Linux, it runs on a Raspberry Pi. And there's a huge, huge ecosystem. So the, the pins they have on here, these pins along here, you can plug all manner of different things into the Raspberry Pi, um, and there's great libraries for using it. I mean, things like, oh, what have we got here? Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, how about a remote control car? You know, that plugs in, it's connected to the pins on top. See along there. Remote control car powered by Pi with cameras and all that kind of stuff on there. So there's a whole great ecosystem that works for the work with the Raspberry Pi. Um, so the, there's a compute module you can get if you want to put it into production environments. You prototype on your like your Pi 4 and then you take your compute module and can build that into custom PCBs and kind of whatever you want, uh, which is a great way to actually use Raspberry Pis in professional environments. Cool. And that's kind of all I wanted to cover today. I wanted to look at, um, you know, do a bit of a deeper dive into some of the um, uh, you know, some of the, the, the components of an IoT application, kind of see how you put it all together and then dive deeper into dev kits um, so you can kind of get an idea a bit more of what the hardware is and how the hardware works. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be looking at office hours. So tomorrow is kind of just an open Ask Me Anything session. Uh, you can come along, ask any questions. Obviously, still a few more questions in the chat that I will um, I will answer in just a second. But yeah, so tomorrow is just rock up, ask me whatever questions you like. Uh, which should be a bit of fun. And then next week, we're going to actually start talking about sensors and actuators, uh, see how they work, look at some of the electronics behind it. No soldering irons, don't worry. Just understand a bit about the electronics behind it. And then we'll actually start building a basic night light on uh, probably on the Wii terminal where it picks up light levels and use that to control an LED. So let's zip back to your questions. Um, RP2040 supports bridge with MicroPython, right? Do we have Raspberry OS as available for RP04? Okay, so the RP2040, that's the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is this one here. It's a microcontroller from Raspberry Pi. It's got a really interesting architecture for sending data through pipelines for managing input output, which is quite cool. Uh, you can code this with MicroPython. So it's, you can code C or C++ or MicroPython. MicroPython is a Python variant that can pass down from microcontrollers. Um, and yep, you can do both on there. Um, I, I focus on C and C++ because there's more support for libraries across things like the Arduino framework. But yeah, totally right, you can code this in MicroPython. It's a lovely little device. It's like a $1 device. Uh, they gave away free on a magazine. It's like that cheap. It's a lovely little microcontroller. Um, and do we have Raspberry OS as of available for RPI4? So Raspberry OS is the old name for the Raspberry Pi operating system. It's now called Raspberry Pi OS. It's basically the same thing. Uh, that is available for the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, now, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a 64-bit machine. And the, I believe the 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS is still in development. I haven't seen that popping up as the standard option in the, the flash and the, um, the SD card flasher recently. So, but yes, there is a full version that supports the Raspberry Pi um, 4. I believe you have to use the 64-bit version to use the 8 gig of RAM version. Um, but I'm not sure what the state of development is in the 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS. Um, 
Awesome. I think that's all the questions. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I love talking about this, as you can probably tell. I say tomorrow, same time, same place, office hours. Bring your questions. We can kind of discuss some of the things we looked at today. We can spin up a few devices and have a play with them. And then on Monday next week, Pacific time, which if you're in New Zealand, is going to be early in the morning on Tuesday. Then we're going to look at actual playing with some sensors, actuators and kind of interacting with the physical world. Um, but with that, thank you very much. Uh, if you could fill out the survey, you know, doing things like these office hours is kind of a new thing for us. So please would love your, your feedback on uh, any of the sessions so far. Um, and you can check out what's coming up next week on the series page. And we're going to be posting all the videos of this to there and onto YouTube. And so with that, um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day, however much that might be. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow.